The Lorax by Dr. Seuss At the far end of town, where the brickle grass grows, and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows, and no birds ever sing except in old crows, is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the crickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax? And why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the crickle grass grows? The old onceler still lives here. Ask him, he knows. You won't see the onceler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lift room on top of his store. He lurks in his lift room, holes under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of myth muffled meat. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail, and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snoo, his secret strange hole, and his gruberous gruff. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper ma phone, for secrets I tell are for your ears alone. Slup, down the slups the whisper ma phone to your ear, and the old onceler's whispers are not very clear. Since they have to come down through his sniggerly hose, and he sounds as if he had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorox got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swanee swans rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place, and first I saw the trees, the trufilla trees, the bright colored troughs of the trufilla trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbaloots frisking about in their barbaloot suits. As they played in the shade, and ate true full of fruits. From the rippleless pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those true full of trees, all my life I've been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their trucks was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh buttery milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what to do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a tree full of tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a thread. The instant I'd finished, I heard a bazaar. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I'd chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him? That's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues, and I am asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed, 
What's that thing you've made out of my trufala top? Look, Lorax, I said. There's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I am doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a thneed. A thneed to find something that all people need. It's a shirt, it's a sock, it's a glove, it's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for your bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are being crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool sneed. But the very next minute, I proved he was wrong. For just at that minute, a chap came along, and he thought that the sneed I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety eight. I laughed at the Lorax, you poor stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. I rushed across the room and in no time at all, built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts, and I said, listen here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole Wunzler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast. Take the road to North Niche. Turn left at Weehawken. Sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunzler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting needs, just as busy as bees, to the sound of the chopping of trufala trees. Then, oh baby O, oh, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow, so I quickly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four trufala trees at one smacker. We were making sneeze four times as fast as before, and the Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week, he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloops, who played in the shade in their barbaloop suits, and happily lived eating trufala fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking, my trees go to the ground. There's not enough trufala fruits to go around, and my poor barbaloops are all getting the cup because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They loved living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the Wensler, felt sad as I watched them go. But business is business, and business must grow, regardless of the crummies in the tummies, you know. I meant no harm, I most truly did not, but I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads. Of the thneeds I shipped out, I was shipping them forth, to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on the biggering, selling more thneeds, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when the old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax. He coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled. He snarled and he sniffed. Wunzler, he cried with a cruffless croak. Wunzler, you're making such smurderous smoke. My poor swarmy swans. Why, they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in his throat. And so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about the gluppity glup. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop. 
making gluppity glup, also schloppity schlop. And what do you do with its leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old once learned man, you. Swing the pond where the humming fish hums. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gums. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get wolfery weary. In search of some water that isn't so smeary, I hear things are just as bad up in Lake Erie. And I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yappity yap and say, bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you. I intend to go on doing just as I do, and for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more truthful trees into thieves, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree, and we heard the tree fall the very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more thneeds, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke-smuggered stars. Now all that was left beneath the bad smell and sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax, and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backwards glance, as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants, and I'll never forget the grim look on his face, when he heisted himself and took leave of this place, through a hole in the smog, without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I couldn't guess. That was long, long ago, but each day since that day, I've sat here and worried, and worried away. Through the years, while my buildings have fallen, I've worried about it with all of my heart. But now, says the Wensler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch, calls the Lensler. He lets something fall. It's a truffula seed. It's the last one of them all. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds. And the truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from all axes and hacks. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. What was the Lorax trying to do? The Lorax was trying to protect the environment for the brown barbalutes, the swanee swans, and the hummingfish, but the Wensler's business grew too big, forcing everyone to leave.